Uh, hello and welcome. Good afternoon to everyone. Uh, thank you for coming to our session today. We're slowly going to start. Um, let me first introduce myself. My name is Gloria Trifonova. I'm an analyst at the Center for the Study of Democracy, specializing in anti-EU and anti-NATO disinformation, and more recently, gender disinformation. The topic we're discussing today remains largely unexplored, especially here in Bulgaria. With this panel, we will aim to bring different regional perspectives uh, to the forefront and experiences from across the region so that we can provide a comprehensive overview of how gendered narratives operate. As we all know, gender has become somewhat of a controversial topic. Um, it's definitely part of the wider pro-Kremlin pro discursive ecosystem. It frames the West as decadent and aims to portray the Kremlin as the defender of Christian values and traditional uh, values, I guess. But don't worry, we won't just focus on the challenges. We'll also try to provide some potential solutions for addressing the issue. Because if we begin this journey now, I believe we can make way for some meaningful pro progress here and in the wider uh, region. Without further ado, I will start to introduce our wonderful panel today. Uh, our first speaker is Christina Tsavala. Uh, she is also an analyst at the Center for the Study of Democracy. She has expertise in anti-corruption, rule of law, and state capture. She's a contributor to enhancing anti-corruption capabilities across Southeast Europe through the CELDI network. And she's an active participant in legislative working groups within the Ministry of Justice. Her notable research uh, includes research on the limitations of anti-corruption mechanisms in Bulgaria, and more recently, gender disinformation. After Christina, we'll have Kate Lewinin. Uh, she's a senior project manager at the Artemis Alliance. Uh, Kate co-delivers the Artemis Alliance, which is an international network of women's and LGBT plus CSOs that aim to counter gender and identity disinformation. Uh, they currently work across Armenia, Georgia, and Poland. After uh, that, we will have Teona Dalekishvili. She's a senior program officer at the Transform Activity at IRX Georgia. Uh, <clears throat> Teona works on a global pilot project supporting practical strategies against technology-facilitated gender-based violence with a special focus on women in politics and public life. Uh, then we also have Anna Aravadze with us. She's a project con uh, coordinator for Forset in Georgia. Uh, Forset is a creative Georgian enterprise using data design and technology to support challenge, uh, change makers. We will also have uh, Eliza Kotovska joining us online from the Kaszczuszko Institute. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, from Poland. She's a coordinator at an independent think tank focusing on policy solutions and interdisciplinary research. And finally, but not least, we will have Brian Zakharyev, who's a program director at the Open Society Institute in Bulgaria. He's a sociologist. Uh, holding over 20 years of experience in education and social integration projects. And now we will begin uh, the panel with the first presentation by my colleague, Christina. Thank you. Ah, thank you. Um, is the presentation going to be? Maybe you can start when it shows there. OK. Um, Uh, I'm so glad that we have the opportunity to open a discussion in Bulgaria for uh, gender disinformation. Uh, and we have gathered such great panelists today with us uh, to show uh, how this issue is pressing not only for women but also for men. And thank you all for being here uh, and to all the audience that is here. Uh, and I'm looking forward to hear to your presentations as well. Okay, my presentation is up now. Um, gender. The gender dimension is just one of the many pillars of the Kremlin propaganda, but its influence in Bulgaria has not been studied quite well yet. The Kremlin's use of gender propaganda has significant real-life impact, such as the lack of support for the Istanbul Convention among the Bulgarian public, which led to the rejection of its ratification, and the overwhelming support for the Anti-LGBT Propaganda Act. This act was passed in Parliament with 135 votes in favor and 57 against this September, or if it wasn't even August, 
uh, and if it wasn't for, it wasn't only the Revival Party, which is the far-right populist pro-Russian party in Bulgaria who introduced the act, um, but also there were staunch supporters from across the entire political spectrum in Bulgaria who supported this legislation, such as the Bulgarian Socialist Party and uh, the mainstream GERP party, uh, which name is Citizens for European Development of Bulgaria. That's the translation of the party. Mm. My colleague Gloria and I conducted the research on Ukrainian female refugees and the disinformation against them in Bulgaria. Our main findings show that the gender and identity disinformation affect ra rather severely vulnerable groups, such as elderly people and children. Though they are not targeted particularly by the gender disinformation campaigns, the gender and identity disinformation also disincentivizes the public when it comes to sexual crimes, rape, and human trafficking with the purpose of sexual exploitation. The gender disinformation against Ukrainian refugees portrayed them as economic burdens and moral threats, which leads to hostility and discrimination towards the Ukrainian community of migrants in Bulgaria, even those who lived here before the war. And there used to be a sizable community of Ukrainian expats who have lived here for a very long time. Many of them started to face hate crimes, abuse, and physical violence once the war started. And they report that they have not such experience beforehand. The narratives about Ukrainian women in Russia depict them as promiscuous, lazy, and decadent, allowing Russia to cast itself as a defender of the traditional Christian values against the morally corrupt and decayed West. Ukrainians are presented uh, among the Russian segments with different stereotypes. One of them is being lazy and dependent and that they're unwilling to work. Uh, and therefore, they search for well of European men for financial gains and for citizenships. Many stories on Telegram channels also claim that Ukrainian refugee women turn to sex work uh, on their personal whim, suggesting their moral decay and promiscuity. And finally, there is a narrative that Ukrainian women are misfits for the European society due to their looks, meaning that they're dressing indecently, they have a lot of plastic surgeries, and they wear excessive makeups. Last but not least, there is the narrative about uh, portraying Ukrainian women as health threats due to them carrying uh, deadly diseases such as HIV. Before the war started, Ukrainian women were rarely mentioned in Bulgarian media, despite, as I already mentioned, there used to be a community here. But after February 2022, coverage on Ukrainian women spiked by 90 times, and the number of publishing outlets increased tenfold. So you can see that there are a few uh, other sources. Is basically, uh, it, entangle, it includes the group of high quality media uh, or neutral media, while the rest, which, is which are five medias, they are uh, rather disinformation pro Kremlin outlets. The shift reflects heightened attention to Ukrainian refugees, especially since 93% of the 2 million who crossed the border of Bulgaria were women and children. Our analysis shows that since the start of the invasion, pro-Kremlin outlets dominate the coverage of the topic, surpassing the neutral and the high quality ones, as you can see here in the graph. In Bulgaria, the most prominent narratives, not surprisingly, uh, mirror those uh, which are popular among the Russian segments. Um, they reinforce the stereotypes, which are that Ukrainians are gold diggers who are trying to seduce and marry Bulgarian men for their European passports, while Ukrainian men are at war. The other one, which was very popular, is that Ukrainian women are predominantly occupied with their looks in the hairstyles, manicures, beauty salons, cosmetics, uh, and they have a lot of plastic surgery and they're not willing to work. Uh, they're preoccupied only with their vanity. The other one is that Ukrainian women are only able to work as prostitutes and escorts, which also mirrors that the higher interest uh, in the online sphere in general for uh, Ukrainian porn. Uh, results have shown that uh, the, searches in on the searches online have increased uh, more than 600 times once the war started. Uh, when it comes to sexual content, including Ukrainians. 
And finally, but not least, as I already mentioned, uh, uh, that Ukrainian women bring deadly sexually transmitted diseases. Usually, this information uh, includes also men. However, due to the you know, particular dimension of sexualization of women, it is related, and in, in Bulgaria, the stereotype kind of relates mostly to women. And also because we do not have a lot of uh, Ukrainian refugees who are male. The results from social media mirror those in the online media. Here you can see that the Facebook pages, which discuss the topic the, of Ukrainian women who spread HIV. As you can see, there are titles of the Facebook pages, uh, which are quite interesting. We can see several which are called uh, Friends of Putin in Bulgaria, um, Support for Russia. Uh, there is one name which uh, is too long, but it's for friendship between Russia and Bulgaria. Uh, and the other one, which is Bulgarians love Russia. Uh, these are quite clearly pro-Russian groups and pro-Kremlin groups. Uh, there are other two which are called I support Jean Vidinov and support for Ivan Geshev. And those particular figures are not, in essence, pro-Russian or related to Russia or anything like that. But the supporters of those groups are rather nationalist. So they have a kind of a common uh, shared vision of uh, nostalgia towards the socialist times and a kind of a preference for authoritarianism in general. When it comes to the distribution of this information campaign regarding each narrative, which you can see here in the graphs, uh, we noted that there are higher interactions around the wars on set reflect reflecting the initial public interest in the topic. By 2023 and 2024, interactions generally appear low, suggesting a decline in the public response and the public interest. The top two narratives with the highest engagement are that Ukrainians are gold diggers and are superficial. Uh, this spiked significantly in early 2022 uh, with another peak in early 2003, suggesting a targeted campaign to revive the stereotype. The other narrative is about the carrying of deadly diseases, which presents them as health threats to amplify xenophobia and gender stigmatization. So now it's time to talk about the solutions, or rather what has been done firstly. Um, when it comes to gender, pretty much nothing. Uh, I have divided here the recommendations in two. Uh, one is focusing on the online media sphere, so media regulation, and the other one focuses on cybersecurity. Cybersecurity is important because, in fact, a lot of the disinformation leads to uh, online, includes actually online harassment, uh, includes online violence, cyberbullying, and a lot of scams which target particularly people from vulnerable groups, such as refugees, those who do not know the local language, uh, especially elderly people and children who have lower media literacy rate. Uh, I'm not going into detail in particular uh, regarding each of those uh, recommendations that I have provided here, but what I would like to stress uh, is the ad hoc multi-stakeholder multi task force uh, comprised of journalists, tech companies, and prosecutors. It could also include police officers, investigators, media experts, um, also NGOs and researchers uh, who are needed to create a package of gender-based violence prevention and mitigation. This is important because there is a very significant gap between the outdated legislation in Bulgaria and also the lack of regulation in online media, uh, its relation to the IT sector, which is very fast-paced uh, and it uh, has increased, has developed quite a lot. Bulgaria is the leading, uh, Bulgaria has the leading IT sector in the region and this vacuum, which is created between uh, the government, which lacks technical capacity to prosecute essentially any type of cyber crimes. It has very limited personnel to do that, including uh, very inconsistent methodologies. Um, it creates uh, a space for the proliferation of such kind of abuse, and there is an effective impunity to the perpetrators. Uh, so it is important to 
include different uh, representatives from different uh, aspects of the problem so that there can be uh, a comprehensive package of, uh, of measures to every different aspect of those crimes. Not only to prevention, but also that's why there needed to be journalists, because journalists are the main victims of smear campaigns. Uh, also, the tech companies and the IT sector representatives are very important because they can actually point what are the shortcomings through which the perpetrators use uh, so that they can harass and abuse different people. Um, and finally, but not least, of course, law enforcement, which are those who need to ensure that uh, uh, all of the sanctions are implement implemented and the uh, investigation is conducted properly. In general, what is also very needed in Bulgaria for all of the legislations related to cybercrime, uh, to discrimination, uh, and also to hate speech, there needs to be a gendered approach. There is no gendered approach in the investigation of those crimes, um, including uh, there is no gender approach in the support of the victims, which is very critical because there are few crimes which target primarily women, such as human trafficking uh, for sec with the purpose of sexual exploitation. And this largely happens through online fake job alerts, uh, including that the Roman scams target primarily single women in Bulgaria, and other crimes too also target women primarily. Uh, also one of the main reasons for that is uh, the lower uh, media literacy rates in this part of the group of the society. And in particular when it comes to refugees, there is important uh, to have uh, explicit information once they arrive in the country to point at different threats that they would need to be prepared for, which has been lacking in Bulgaria. There, there was no coordinated action uh, in the country once the war started, including, that's a very good example I would like to present about how this inf gender disinformation uh, actually has real life effects. Because for example, the main, uh, the main spot where Ukrainians entered Bulgaria was, and they stayed there for a long time, that was Varna, a city on the Black Sea coast. Uh, it, initially, the mayor of Varna uh, rejected the appeal of the, of the government to implement the support measures for the Ukrainians. And he claimed that, uh, the mayor himself claimed that they are not going to help those who come here to settle and use the uh, resources of Bulgaria, and all of the support initially remained uh, in the hands of NGOs and different CSOs. So thanks a lot for listening to my presentation, and I hope you found it interesting. Uh, you can find out more about uh, our research uh, on our website, and we're going to publish uh, another publication recently by the end of this month on the topic. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. Um, I think working on this project uh, and conducting this research, one of the biggest takeaways for me was how closely the narratives in Bulgaria about Ukrainian women mirror the narratives uh, in Russia. And we should definitely, as researchers of this information, allow more space for uh, featuring the gender dimension in, into our research, because while we focus on energy and other important areas, uh, gender often gets overlooked, especially in our uh, part of the world. Uh, next, I'll actually give the floor to Kate, who will give us more information about Armenia. Great. I think there should be my presentation coming up. Great. Just while that's coming, um, what a hard act to follow. I'm definitely going to be asking you afterwards about that research, because one thing I'm really keen to kind of bang the drum on is we need more research in this area. We really need to understand the context that we're working in. So um, I am going to be talking to you about the Artemis Alliance uh, today and the work we're doing in Armenia in particular. We've got lots of great work going on in Georgia, but I'm going to let my colleagues speak about that from their point of view, and Elisa is going to speak from Poland. Fantastic. Um, so Artemis Alliance, we're an international network of women and LGBT plus CSOs and we work to counter gender and identity disinformation 
all with the aim of building social cohesion and resilience against malign actors' interference. We work in three countries, and we do three things. We increase understanding of GID and how to counter it. I think there's still some educating and some positioning that we need to do, even within the disinformation fields, about kind of that GID is a, a tactic of disinformation, and we need to kind of see it as a really important thing to be addressing. We build local partners' ability to challenge, adapt, and to respond to GID crucially, safely, and effectively. And the third thing we do, I'm going to be focusing on this today, is we deliver insight-led local interventions that increase in, uh, awareness of and resilience to GID amongst target audience. And why do we bother? Why are we here? Why are we all in the room? We want to be working towards cohesive, democratic societies where everybody, not just women, not just LGBT plus people, but everybody, because they're all affected by GID, can participate fully, free from polarizing divisions and malign actors' interference. Um, we agreed when we were planning this uh, panel that I would give a, an overview of GID, which I think we kind of broadly all agree with. And there are four components. The first, it's deliberately spread false information that targets people based on their gender, gender identity, and sexuality. Crucially, it's for political gain. So that's what separates it from hate crime or from um, discrimination more generally. Its aim is to discredit and silence um, people from the LGBT plus community and women. Um, it exploits uh, social norms about gender and sexuality. And social norms to us are basically the unwritten rules or behaviors that we all follow in a society. If you don't follow them, there'll be some negative reaction. And social norms are being exploited in order to really uh, cause polarization, to cause chaos in a society. That's the aim of the, um, of the narrative. I'm so sure I can barely see the bottom of the uh, screen. Um, and why does GID kind of happen? What's the, what's the impact of it? Yeah, it targets uh, civic participation, it undermines it, it threatens individual rights, and it has real world violence, like we heard a second ago. So um, let's go to Armenia. I'm going to set the scene a little bit here. Um, very high levels of GID, mainly found on social media, more commonly so, but still very present on traditional media. The main GID narratives that we see are around family values, LGBT plus rights, and around the security situation, which is ongoing. And the consortium, the Artemis Alliance consortium, have done a lot of research understanding what social norms kind of are featuring in each of the three countries. And the, the three that I wanted to talk about here um, and are really present in Armenia are perceived gender equality. Women have it just as good as men, if not better, actually. Uh, women's role in society, uh, kind of whether they should be in leadership, absolutely not, not at all. Uh, a focus group discussion uh, described women in leadership as uh, equal to being the devil. Um, they should be at home as a wife and as a mother, but also working and bringing some money home. Yeah. <laughs> and the, the last one is around anti-LGBT plus attitudes, which are really strong in Armenia. <coughs> And the reason we undertook this research was to make sure that we're really tailoring every intervention and every exploration into how to counter GID. And I'm going to share two examples. I forgot to put the timer on, but keep me, uh, keep me going. Um, the first one. A CSO in Armenia um, undertook a project looking at women's role in leadership hoping to solve the problem that GID is exploiting gender social norms and really limiting women's ability to hold leadership roles across all levels of society. The project aimed to increase understanding of and resilience to GID in a number of target audiences. In GID victims themselves, women in regional areas of Armenia who are very susceptible to and vulnerable to GID and to decision makers. The project had two main components. The first was a targeted social media campaign featuring interviews with women in self-government roles who had been victims of GID. And these women expressed uh, kind of what it was like to be targeted by GID. They named the fact it was GID, and they talked about how they overcame it. So it was quite hope-based. 
And this was followed by a really interesting campaign led by vloggers and uh, influencers speaking in Armenian dialects, talking about the issue but using humour, using levity to really reach audiences that might have been kind of shut away or pushed away from this kind of difficult to hear topic. The second uh, component of this project was um, media monitoring to understand where are these GID narratives taking place? Who are the platforms that are allowing or enabling or spreading this? Along with a legislative analysis, exploring how the law in Armenia could be used as a lever to combat GID. So what are the outcomes? The project finished about a month and a half ago, uh, but early outcomes hugely successful campaign. Uh, in a population of almost 3 million, the campaign reached 1.5 million people. Of those people, um, we surveyed um, kind of a, a small portion of them. 90% said the stories were inspiring and applicable for their own situation. Audiences are understanding that this is GID and they're kind of realizing this is happening and it exists in Armenian society. The media monitoring um, work was picked up by the, um, the public radio and in um, an outlet you can see here, Media AM, and it's informing upcoming work. And we're really excited about this because we need research firstly to be created, but then to be used and really tailor our interventions. Okay, second example I wanted to share was a national campaign which is reaching the last week or two of its run which basically tried to address the fact that women are largely absent from peace-building work in Armenia, despite the fact that there are a number of huge experts in this area. Women might be asked to participate on a voluntary basis, so they're not getting paid and they're not getting credited. The campaign aimed to reduce the impact of GID narratives that frame women as unsuitable for these roles in peace and security. It, the campaign tried to target disillusioned idealists. These are mainly women who don't feel like change is possible. Armchair experts, so mainly men, who think that they are uh, expert or more expert than these women. And male politicians who would need to be kind of bringing women into these roles. And what the campaign really aimed to do was to challenge people to question those assumptions they might have held on women's expertise in peace and security roles. The campaign was pretty extensive. Uh, it was a fully integrated um, attitude change campaign across TV, out of home, so posters, and a follow on media outreach with female experts, so TV, advert, TV interviews, print interviews, and opinion um, pieces. But rather than me explaining the campaign to you, I thought I could just show you a 60 second video. So I'm hoping if I click to the next slide, it will work but maybe you could press play for me at the back. How's that working? Ah, <laughs> oh, there we go. It's in Armenian, so don't worry if you can't hear it. You can see here that it really played on the assumptions that you're making at the start. This is going to be the man who's the, the expert. I mean, I also had the same opinion when I first watched it. Um, but it's a gentle way of bringing people in and kind of, um, in a surprising way, kind of showing you the difference. If I click it again, I think, there we go, fantastic. So the outcome of the campaign, uh, which hasn't quite finished yet, um, is going really well. So, so far, just from the digital campaign, 1.2 million people reach and 6 million impressions. Posters that like you can see on the right-hand side there are, are all across Armenia. And we managed to reach the target audience. 
which made it so impressive and so exciting that there was such little pushback. This is a contentious topic. It's, it's very uh, difficult to talk about the security situation in Armenia. So little pushback and high levels of positive engagement. Those surveyed um, said that we, they saw that increased agreement inclu of including women in negotiations leads to lasting peace being more likely. And also, um, there was an increased online advocacy for women taking up these roles. So final thoughts from me before I hand over. We definitely need to be seeing some more collaboration here. Um, we need more collaboration in the disinformation field generally, and then within our field, we really, really need it. And we need people coming at this from different points of view, bringing their different skills, and um, making sure that we can kind of move together to address this kind of ever-changing topic. Am I out of time? No, you're good. Okay, great. Um, research is key. So we need to be doing this research. We need to be kind of collating it. And that's why Artemis Alliance has the Learner Consult Hub, as we call it. We bring in great research. I'll be talking to you afterwards. And we make sure that it's shared to the people that need to hear it. So if you have great research, let me know. We're also um, editing a um, special issue of the gen uh, Gender Studies Journal, so if you've got great stuff there, let me know as well. There is work to do. GID is ever-changing. It's hard to define, and it moves constantly. And so we need to move constantly with it, and we need to keep our focus. We need to keep trying with advocacy and policy work. It's harder, but we need to keep going, and we need to keep learning and be honest with each other when things don't work. Otherwise, we won't really get very far very quickly. Uh, thank you, Kate. Uh, it was a great presentation, and my favorite part, to be honest, was the campaign that you ran. I think this is definitely something that we can take as a good practice and try to imitate, to be honest, because we're lacking such uh, content, at least here in Bulgaria, I haven't really run across uh, any campaign that addresses our uh, innate kind of perceptions of, uh, of women, especially. And uh, just in the uh, view of time, let's go with our next presentation by Teona. Thank you. Um, I hope that my presentation will also come up soon on the screen, but before that I want to Show the gratitude to the organizers for inviting us here in such a difficult times for Georgia. You probably know that our people are right now fighting for um, getting back our falsified elections um, and for the basic human rights, which probably a few years ago was kind of not really forecasted and not seen that this could happen to our country. But this is a good example, if it can be called good, that these things can happen anywhere and you are never protected how this disinformation is affecting your personal life, your personal identity, your family, your children, and so on. And I'm really happy that this um, panel discussion brought a very important topic of the gender dimension, um, because gender is not something that should be spoken or protected by women, because we are speaking about at least, if, you, if we're speaking about women, we're speaking about at least half of the population, and if we're speaking about gender in general, then I think we're speaking about the um, whole population of the world, which should be taking care of fighting back the democracy and not letting anybody to shrink the spaces for people with different identities. Um, I represent IREX, Georgia. I'm leading program Transform in my country, um, and we are tackling very important question of uh, tech-facilitated gender-based violence. We call it TFGBV. I know when you hear this abbreviation, you are probably a bit scared because it's long and not very clear and not very popular because it's very new. Last year when we started working on the TFGBV, everybody was pretty surprised of what we are meaning by that. But this year, it's on the table. Everybody is talking about it worldwide because Online violence, online gender-based violence, GID, is now really affecting everybody. Um, our program is a three-year pilot program. We are working in Georgia, Kenya, and Guatemala. You are probably surprised by this, um, how we pick these countries, but it's a pilot program, which means that it's one of the first programs that's working on the tech-facilitated gender-based violence. So we picked one country per continent to see how this is um, 
how this is affecting uh, people's lives. We do a lot of research, and I absolutely agree with Kate that it's very important to research this and to see what's happening because it's very new. It's also not very easy to research, but it's also very difficult to see what's the impact, but still, like if you are observing it in very different parts of the world, you can also see how much differences they are, but mostly how similar the personal, um, sometimes tragedies and personal stories can be, no matter if the woman is living in Georgia, in um, South Africa, in US, or in UK. I mean, the situation is unfortunately similar and prevalence is very high. In Europe, it's 72% and it's the best number. Um, we try to tackle TFGBV through a um, few main directions. One is capacity building because if you want to tackle this, you need to inform people what it is and how dangerous it is because online violence is not often taken serious. If somebody is not hitting you, you are not considered as a survivor of the gender-based violence. And I think that's one of the biggest challenge. So speaking about it, and even survivors, they don't take it serious. If somebody threatened to rape me online, they are online, I don't know them. So why is this violence? I think this is the usually also the perspective of also survivors, and they don't understand how much trauma it leaves in your life. Um, second big direction that we have besides capacity building, um, and I'm happy that our capacity building modules will be coming public very soon so I can be able to share it with all of you, probably through um, the, the organizers. We are funding um, local organizations, all, all three countries who are doing their interventions, be it research, be it campaign, uh, but especially developing the tech solutions. You can't force civil society organizations to take responsibility for something that is perpetrated by the tax sector because it's creating engagement, it's uh, creating money. Um, it was uh, mentioned like how influencers are getting money while they're, um, while they're promoting, for example, Kremlin propaganda because it's creating engagement and it's creating hate and then it creates money so sometimes Kremlin even doesn't have to pay them because that's what's sold on the social media. People like to read. Um, harassing content, unfortunately. Um, and we do a lot of research and we also do a lot of support to the survivor serving organizations because one of the problems is that survivor serving organizations are taking the whole responsibility to take care of the survivors, to take care of themselves, and sometimes they're not even empowered with the tools because, as Kate mentioned, like it's changing so fast and it's technology, not all of us. Um, are very good in technology, right? There might be things that we don't know. There might be hacking techniques that we cannot react to. So it's also very difficult to only put this responsibility on survivor serving organizations, but we're still trying to build the capacity so they can protect themselves as much as possible, as well as survivors, and keep the trauma-informed approaches, which I think is the most important and less advo least advocated, because when you're working with the survivors, it's also very important not only to fight for the truth, but also to protect them. And this is something that should not be unseen or somehow um, uh, ignored. So um, what is TFGBV, Tech Facilitated Gender-Based Violence? And I want to um, mention here that sometimes it's easier to use online gender-based violence, but tech-facilitated gender-based violence can be happening offline, using technologies that can tackle you even without using the internet. Um, and that's why it's also very important to keep this um, name and keep this definition. Um, so it's basically all kinds of violence that is also happening offline, but gone online or perpet like perpetrators using different technologies. For example, in spring, when people were standing on the streets in Georgia protesting the foreign agent law, they were called by hundreds of people. They were receiving threatening calls. That's also tech-facilitated gender-based violence. If you are called uh, um, you are by a person and then the harassment is sexualized or it's using different narratives or they are calling your husband, for example, and threatening him that if you don't shut up, you will get some problems. So it, it includes cyber stalking, doxing, trolling, cyber bullying, hate speech, public shaming, gender and identity disinformation, of course, and threatening. 
Um, and what's very important is by global studies, we can see that at least 83% of women have been affected or have seen TFGBV. And um, it's three times more of a number uh, compared to the male people who have received violence, violent comments or been affected by the violence online. Um, some of the main findings that I can share by our work, as I said, it's a pilot program, so we're experimenting a lot and it's really a um, good opportunity for us to learn a lot and then share our learnings. GID is the most recognizable type of TFGPV for women in politics and public life. We are especially working with the women in politics and public life because it's also shown that they are mostly affected. So, And by public life, I think we can mean any woman who wants to openly speak up her mind and share her opinion. Um, there are lots of policy gaps and uh, there are lots of legislative gaps. So we have, for example, law on the data protection, we have the law on the gender violence, but there is no way to connect them. So it's usually when it comes to the online gender-based violence, it's almost impossible to somehow find a name for it and uh, to punish the perpetrators. Um, intersectionality, I think it was very well mentioned also by Christina that more vulnerable you are in general, um, more um, to due to your identity, be it being a refugee, being living in a conflict, be it being a religious or ethnic minority. We have a third of population which is religious or ethnic minority. You are in more danger, and you are in double danger because if perpetrators are also harassing you, and then your cultural norms are also not. Um, giving you possibility to openly speak about it at your home. Not everybody can tell, tell their family members they are threatened online because then they are also threatened from their family members. So it's, it's a danger that can duplicate if you speak up, speak up about it. That's why most of the cases are going silent. And in Georgia, we don't have number of cases. One thing is the legislation gap, but another thing is that people are scared to report. People are scared to be laughed about if they say they they were harassed online and that's why they are going to the court. There is a lack of the solidarity networks because when people are polarized, and it was mentioned many times, sometimes we might not be really like divided, but we, um, but all the disinformation is forcing you to feel like your society is divided and we are not agreeing each other. So sometimes even people who are on the same side of the story, they are also um, harassing each other online uh, and because, uh, they are tense, they are stressed, and they are protecting themselves. And there is a lack of rapid response. This spring, we have launched the rapid response funding for the activists to give them psychosocial and cybersecurity support. And we got the feedback that it was the almost the only opportunity where they could receive this help so rapidly. Because if you are in, if you are a survivor, if you need psychosocial support, and then the foundation tells you that it will be like a one month process, you don't need that, right? You need to be um, heard right away when something is happening. So it's very important to create such um, services. Um, we have actually implemented two case studies. We can't publish them, unfortunately, because uh, both case studies showed that main perpetrator in Georgia is our government. It's a Georgian dream. So if you publish this, you are even putting under danger the researchers who worked on that because you are openly saying that, yeah, the online violence is mainly caused by the, um, by the rulers of the country. And of course, we can see the Kremlin influence and narratives, gender disinformation in Georgia is fueled by them, it's paid by them. Um, and um, it was mentioned, um, I think, yesterday or today, that sometimes they're targeting social narratives in the country, sometimes not. In Georgia, they definitely know people very well. They know what people get angry about, what will play on their nerves, so they know very well those social norms and they are using them very well for targeting um, especially women in politics and public life. Georgian Dream Party and their proxies which are initiating different laws but are also openly harassing women online and offline. Our president who is a woman has been harassed a lot, not because of her political ideas but because she is a woman. And a lot of uh, AI falsified data has been spread also in the past weeks which are sexualizing her and putting her in, creating this image that 
being president or being leading, leading country is not a woman's work. And of course, this also creates this feeling that if you are also in leading position, you might be affected by the perpetrators. So you feel fear, and that's very natural. It's okay to be afraid to be influenced by um, the perpetrators. And there are different tactics, of course. So if two years ago the perpetrators were going more like uh, unknown, using different names. Now they're openly saying that, yeah, it's us, we are doing all this disinformation work, and it's usually, again, the Georgian dream. Um, we cancel gender quotas, we change the legislation, we now have anti-LGBT law, which is against the LGBT propaganda, as they say it, but it's actually against freedom of speech. Uh, because even if you're mentioning gender identity in Georgia now, you might be captured because it's against the law. Um, and you all know about the Russian foreign agent law, which basically put under risk the existence of the civil society. And of course, you're having a chilling effect. Uh, this is something that happens when you see violence going online or you are affected by this violence. And half of the politi like women politicians and 30% of journalists are saying that they are uh, either quitting or they are becoming less loud, they're canceling their online accounts, so they are not talking anymore. So of course what, what, what it means is that you are basically shutting down the voice of half of the population by not paying attention to the TFGBV. Um, and I also want to tackle another case study which we did, which was about like safe spaces. We do have some safe spaces, there are some positive developments. Uh, we, our grantees now have also developed some um, solutions. We have safety application where we also add a TFGPV forum. So if you're affected, you can write there and you get the advice from the lawyer or cybersecurity expert. But another problem that we found out through this uh, studies, again, going back to where I started with, um, if you are creating safe space, you need to have capacity, you need to know how you can be attacked, how your group can be attacked, how the disinformation can be born in your group, how trolls and bots can also be there. So it's also very important to build the capacity of the moderators who are working on these groups. Including the groups now, we have like at least 10 groups, I guess, for organizing demonstrations and so on. And when you're writing there, you're feeling like I'm so safe, I'm writing my opinion, sometimes even some crazy ideas. And it's not safe, because if the moderators are not aware of how to keep the content safe, how you can have safe spaces safe, it will be impossible and it can be even more dangerous because then you are openly speaking about some plans you have and they might go anywhere. I have seen my Facebook chats in um, uh, some state agency high level managers inboxes because they were shared by some of the people I knew and this is something that happens very usually that information is leaking from very close circle. So being careful is very important. Um, I've heard today also a comment that we're talking a lot about problems and we need to speak about the solutions. So um, some things that we found out that could be strategies is like, uh, one of the things is like, when we are creating safe spaces, we need to take responsibility and really keep them safe, educate ourselves or educate others as much as we can, um, because online spaces cannot be 100% safe, but we can do as much as we can. Um, it's very important to keep a multi-sectoral approach. Um, we need to speak to the tech companies because, again, their products become the platforms for the perpetrators. You can't put the responsibility of safe spaces on the CSOs. You can't put this responsibility on the people who are fighting. You need to put this responsibility on the tech sector and tech regulators. All the countries where you have more or less good TFGBV uh, legislation, which is like Australia or South Korea, for example, you have regulator who initiated, in the, initiated this. In Georgia, our regulator is unfortunately punishing free media. So right now, this is not an option. But in the best scenario, this is the way of tackling TFGPV. Talk to different sectors, and you don't tell NGOs to do more work to tackle TFGPV. Um, supporting survivors, serving organizations, keeping them educated, giving them the, like now we have launched the rapid response uh, to protect their data, and our like cybersecurity team analyzed um, almost 20 organizations who are working with the survivors, and they, they don't even have data on one device. They are sometimes having data on their personal devices, and this is the data of survivors. So this is the data of people of leakage which might really affect the survivors. This is the data of the 
LGBTQI uh, plus groups. So it, it, it's really very sensitive and sometimes people are keeping them on their personal devices. So we need to also raise the capacity of survivor serving organizations so they are more prepared to what might come. Um, talk to women in politics and public life. Um, this is the comment I've heard from one of the woman parliament member um, in Georgia that she, she said that Everybody thinks that because I'm always fighting and I'm always on TV, I'm a strong person, and I am a strong person, but I also need help, and we are really struggling, and we need psychosocial support, and sometimes we need just people to tell us, you can just rest, you can just um, take care of yourself, or we will take care of you. Um, and of course, like keeping trauma-informed approaches for us is very important, and this is something that we also want to teach or share with the tech sector. Um, thank you very much. Uh, this is the QR code. Uh, you can scan and go to our program uh, page, not to only learn about program, but also download all the materials we created. Everything else we will create will also be published there, so I hope that uh, we can keep you up with, updated with what we're doing. Thank you. I hope I was able to <laughs> Thank you, Teona, especially for giving such a comprehensive overview of what uh, TFGBV is. I don't believe that is very much in the radar of the relevant institutions here, such as the General Directorate for Organized Crime. It should be on the radar for sure. Um, and now we continue with uh, Georgia with our next presenter, Anna. Thank you. Uh, greetings, everyone. Uh, first, I'd like to thank the organizers uh, for giving us opportunity to share our experiences, also colleagues for wonderful presentations, and I'm sure that um, interesting ones are coming up next as well. Um, also, I would like to thank Transform for giving Forset the opportunity to work on this project, uh, which we wanted to do for a while. So, quick introduction of Forset. Um, it is, uh, we focus on data communications through design and technology we do storytelling, advocacy campaigns, educational programs, community buildings, etc., etc. Uh, today, I'll uh, discuss our research on technology-facilitated gender-based violence against women content creators in Georgia. Uh, this project is uh, very unique, and I wanted to explain why it is very crucial to us. In Georgia, there has been a sharp increase in online hate speech, threats, violence uh, towards women in politics and activism. Uh, with the rise of social media and influencer marketing, uh, women content creators face similar risks, but they have not received the same level of attention and same level of care and, uh, and support. And uh, this gap uh, meant that uh, issues affecting women content creators around TFGBV have largely gone un unaddressed. And uh, these women lacked the resources, uh, support, information they needed to recognize uh, these challenges. Uh, our project aimed to close these gaps by raising awareness, um, by uh, providing resources and information, and uh, fostering this uh, development of tech-based solutions to empower women content creators. More about the research itself. Uh, we started with the uh, focus groups to understand the needs of the women content creators. And uh, when I say that uh, this project is quite unique, uh, when we even did the research, uh, it's globally was uh, not uh, really um, so much data about this issue. I think we are the first ones who started including content creators in TFGPV matters. So uh, this study is also deeply tied uh, to Georgian political and cultural context, examining how TFGPV connects with uh, political development, such as already mentioned uh, controversial Russian law and state surveillances. So this makes our findings especially relevant to our country's context. And our main goals were to raise awareness, uh, employ voices and uh, to promote innovation and this is just a few um, there are more in the research included so uh, I will not um, s mm, stop into the definition part sorry can we have the presentation on the screen <laughs> sorry I did not notice that <laughs> we do not have it there so yep it's good now <laughs> 
Uh, because uh, I'm not going to stop into definition parts. I think uh, Teona explained it uh, wonderfully. So, um, like briefly, um, according to our research brief, uh, the target group included uh, Georgian speaking women who create content on social media platforms such as TikTok, YouTube, uh, Facebook, and uh, Instagram, and who engage in political uh, conversations, in activism conversations, while not necessarily they are activists, but these women respond to current events and help shape uh, public opinion. So it's uh, through their content, uh, through sharing a certain content. So we shortlisted uh, 17 respondents uh, for the study and continued interviewing through mixed um, online conversations, written responses, and uh, voice memos even. And I think that um, ethical considerations that we had uh, going into this research was um, uh, the um, uh, most important part because we take a matter of uh, not to do more harm, uh, in, in this case uh, very uh, important, so ethical con uh, considerations were central throughout data collection and analysis. Maintaining data quality was essential to ensure our findings were both accurate and reliable while minimizing the potential harm uh, to participants. And our interviewers were very well trained, experienced, discussing in sensitive topics, so it ensured a respectful environment for participants as well. Um, these are the criteria that follows here, but I'm going to go into more findings because I think this research has very insightful and important findings. Uh, one of them is that uh, many content creator women uh, are not familiar with the specific terminology of THGPV. Uh, through, uh, they have uh, general awareness and understanding of this, and uh, they often shared examples of online abuse and recognized it as uh, uh, connection to gender-based issues. So uh, creators are aware that uh, digital uh, environment amplifies harmful gender stereotypes and facilitates uh, targeted attacks, uh, especially against women, uh, which can range from abusive comments to threats of uh, sexual harassment. Uh, however, uh, content creator women uh, frequently do not uh, perceive TFGBV as a form of violence, uh, suggesting a broad normalization of this issue, and uh, this uh, actually uh, lack, lack the recognition of the, um, that these uh, cases could be um, taken uh, legally uh, in the hands and should be legally addressed. So, um, hate speech and bullying, sexual harassment and stalking uh, were the most reported forms of TFGBV, and um, tactics were hacking, uh, impersonation, and unwanted messages or posting, and uh, these were the most frequently mentioned uh, things from the content creator women, but uh, although they also shared their experience that uh, anything could uh, trigger these kind of comments and this kind of uh, stories, um, and um, uh, they uh, shared their own experiences rather than others or maybe some things that they've heard. So this was also a very crucial part in our research as well. Uh, but I wanted to uh, like a little bit speak about what actually enables TFGBV and I think the anonymity part is the most important one because in uh, digital platforms often uh, uh, anonymity enables users to ex experience uh, hostile without uh, facing the immediate uh, consequences, so it really leads to aggress uh, aggressive uh, behaviors. Um, and. Uh, now, this was also the important part when the narratives provided by content creator uh, women highlighted the significant impact of uh, trolls and bots and uh, politically motivated hate speech. Um, and I think that all content creator women stated that they experienced this. Uh, and especially when uh, they were going to the manifestations and they were uh, voicing their opinions in terms of ongoing political situations. So um, this really affected them uh, in terms of that. 
And uh, many women uh, report that uh, despite becoming immune uh, to frequent online abuse, uh, their negative comments still deeply impact their mental health and um, self-perception. The effects range from increased anxiety and stress to significant impacts such could be a personal relationship, relationships and self-esteem. And uh, research uh, findings suggest that content creators had have kind of normalized uh, the TFGBV um, and uh, this is just not okay and this is why we uh, work with them very closely to uh, deeply understand and uh, deepen their um, um, uh, knowledge as well. And uh, what can be the coping mechanisms? Uh, I think uh, that this varies uh, really and this uh, uh, really much uh, reflects the situation. So it could be proactive, reactive, but it could be technological safety, legal and information actions, social and emotional support, community management, uh, public awareness, and just personal coping mechanisms that creators themselves have. Um, in the research, there are lots of recommendations for content creator women, for example, to enhance their digital security, uh, also educate their audiences. Uh, there are recommendations for, for NGOs to support services and legal aid, to do more advocacy and educational campaigns and capacity buildings. For state agencies that to recognize TFGBV against content creators and develop specific legal protocols and collect and provide data and also uh, finally for media to promote ethical and uh, gender sensitive reporting in this matter. And uh, following our research that I can share beyond to the research that we've written is that uh, we saw a surge of uh, targeted attacks and reports against content creator women. Uh, especially as they began attending the rallies, as I already mentioned, to support Georgia's European future. So for women journalists and activists, uh, platforms like TikTok, Instagram, etc., are often not their uh, primarily income source, uh, but for content creator women, these platforms are crucial. This is uh, their main job. So it's really um, crucial in terms of that as well. So uh, beyond this research, uh, we have have uh, very strong ties to the content creator women. I think uh, they feel acknowledged in this space that we've created to not be very humble at all here. And um, they, I think, that uh, have uh, this space where they can share their opinions, feel seen, and uh, share the problems that they have, and uh, maybe some of them will have the relevant ones. So I think they are the support system for one another as well. And uh, this approach of uh, TFGBV is not very conventional, but uh, moving forward, we are committed to ensure that women content creators are always included in the conversation of women in public life, uh, because it's uh, somehow a hidden problem there, but in Georgia's uh, perspective, we saw that it was uh, very much relevant. So um, as an organization, as, as myself, we took a responsibility in this as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anna, and thank you especially for highlighting the experience of women, because TFGBV is not just a research term that we are using, it's, it has actual real life impact. Uh, and our next speaker will actually also focus on the cyberspace, however, in Poland, I hope she's online. Do we have any? Let's see if we can get her on the screen. Maybe. Hi, Eliza. I, I think probably we can see you so far. I think we're ready to go if we can hear you. Uh, yes, I can hear everyone. Can everyone can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Fantastic. Well, I'm deeply sorry I cannot be there with you all in person, but I am uh, very happy to be a part online. Uh, I am going to present the recent uh, study that my uh, institute, the Kościuszko Institute, published about gender disinformation in polar cyberspace. 
Uh, we specifically focused on the previous elections which took place in Poland last year as well as the European Parliament elections. This was a very interesting time for us to run this type of analysis because ever since 2020 when the abortion laws uh, were tightened in Poland, there has been a lot of talk about women in cyberspace as well as politics. Women and the topic of women's rights actually became a very huge issue in Poland, so it kind of made it not surprising that they were also very prominent uh, when it came to topics of discussion when it came to the elections. So we specifically wanted to see how disinformation narratives uh, discuss and describe female politicians running for office uh, versus uh, male politicians. And now this was mentioned before, the difference between gender disinformation and hate speech. When we were conducting this analysis, there was actually a lot of hate speech that went along with gender disinformation, and we decided to analyze both uh, because we believe that well, hate speech is very closely tied to gender disinformation, and oftentimes it actually reflected and almost predicted what the gender narratives are going to become. So when it came to the main themes of hate speech that were existent in cyberspace, in, specifically in polar cyberspace, leading up to the elections in 2023, were abortion, migration, feminism, health for women, health for men, and the left is female. So abortion, that is more obvious since our abortion laws were tightened, that became a huge issue and was a very big point of discussion amongst various actors online as well as political groups. Um, out of that actually came this idea of health for women. So this is a phrase that was created by the women's strike, strike Kobiet, uh, that took place after the change in the abortion law. Uh, I'm sorry, am I? Oh, sorry, the screen went blank, so I thought I disappeared, okay. Uh, so, as I was saying, uh, Hell for Women became the catchphrase that these women were saying because they were initiating that the former ruling party were actually creating a Hell for Women by tightening these abortion laws. Now, this movement and this phrase, Hell for Women, kind of started this much lesser known movement uh, health for men. Uh, this movement actually had a lot of actors which would spread hate and gender disinformation. And health for men was the idea that men actually have it worse than women. And I know this topic was already brought up before by one of the panelists. Uh, so this is the idea that women have it much easier because gender is now a very popular topic. And therefore, if you are a woman, you actually have it much easier because people will give you special attention and give you more rights. And being a man is actually much harder. Um, also adding on the idea that women are now straying away from traditional values and men, and it is now harder for men to find a woman that will want to have this traditional life with them. When it comes to feminism, uh, this became a very negative term. Uh, a lot of female politicians that were running, whether they labeled themselves as feminists or not, actually were automatically given the term feminist, and feminism was associated with this stereotypical, uh, this stereotypical idea that women are very emotional, they are irrational, and that everything that they think is very extreme, a very extreme to the left. So feminism was seen as a very bad thing by the more right-leaning actors that were spreading uh, disinformation as well as hatred. And the leftist female was also a trend that we noticed in which any disinformation or uh, hate speech was act that was more on the left side of politics was immediately associated with females and women. So for example, in terms of abortion, uh, when there were uh, narratives and uh, themes of abortion, even though both male and uh, female politicians spoke about abortion, when there was a disinformation text, it would be automatically uh, put in with an image of a woman. So women were associated with extremist left views, which were then used to uh, kind of prove that women are irrational and not intelligent because they believe uh, such lies. So some of the specific hate narratives, a lot of them focused on the physical appearance of a woman because a woman 
uh, is expected to care about her appearance and is expected to always look nice. So there was a lot of hate when it came to the political campaign photos. Uh, so a lot of uh, the female candidates would encounter their political campaign photo, put aside a regular photo taken of them that may be taken from an unattractive angle. Then there were the claims that they are editing their images for the political campaigns and therefore they, they cannot be trusted. So here you see that we are, they are associating physical appearance and how the photo looks like with the credibility of the politician, even though that has nothing to do with politics. Uh, feminists were described, as I mentioned before, as harmful towards society and specifically harmful towards men because of their, uh, their refusal to go along with traditional gender norms, which actually is ruining motherhood because abortion and motherhood were also very similar topics. Uh, it was expected that a woman is automatically meant to be a mother and a feminist is going against uh, nature because a feminist obviously doesn't want children and that is going against uh, what nature intended. Uh, comparisons were also quite popular. Uh, female politicians were compared to activists, to online sex workers, as well as influencers, while male politicians were compared to historical figures. Now, of course, these historical figures were not good a figure such as Hitler. However, there is this very big difference where female politicians are not being compared to politicians or people that had power, but while men are compared to people that have power. And of course, lack of intelligence was a very common, uh, it was very common uh, to see posts under anything that female politicians or even uh, women that were supporting more of the left side, what they immediately were attacking the intelligence and saying that they're uh, not educated, and that they are falling into all this uh, propaganda. Now, this hate speech is very important to speak about because it actually created an environment in which gender disinformation became uh, more believable. Because you, these people are surrounding, they can kind of create this echo chamber, they create a space in which you have so such gender norms being explained that this is what a woman is, this is what a woman has to be doing, that politics is for men, that when, and then when you see a narrative that claims that a woman did this, a female politician did this, then you're more likely to believe, okay, well, that makes sense then, since she's lacking intelligence, and this is the mistake that she did in politics, well, then obviously that makes sense, I'm going to believe this narrative. So the disinformation themes very closely very closely actually reflected hate speech. Uh, so they focused on women being too emotional, uh, being a mother, being unintelligent, and sexualizing the female candidates. When it came to being a mother, uh, there was a lot of uh, disinformation about abortion. So one of the claims was that uh, the more left-leaning side parties want abortion to happen at any age. Uh, I'm sorry, not at any age, at any stage of pregnancy. Uh, this was never stated by any of the political parties, but this was a very popular narrative that was being uh, passed along these groups in order to kind of get people to not be supportive of abortion rights. Uh, being unintelligent, there was a post on Eeks, I believe, where it was a video of a female candidate speaking on a radio show. And she was uh, speaking about her own policies. And one of the commentators asked her if she could name all the borders of Poland. And she said that she will not answer that question uh, because it had nothing to do with what she was talking about. And I was just trying to insult her intelligence. And then the text would actually said, it kinda, kind of had the clip of that video. And it said that the new left, which is the party to which she belonged, wants to get rid of all borders within the EU uh, because their candidates are too dumb to understand uh, what borders are. So it's completely taken out of context. It's And again, the new left party did not say that they want to get rid of any borders in the EU. But you see this idea, it's easier to associate the lack of intelligence because it's a woman, because you have this hate speech that's saying women are less intelligent and shouldn't be in politics. And then you have that as proof of this disinformation narrative. When it comes to being emo too emotional, there was a video... 
uh, which claimed that a female politician was actually yelling at the person who was recording the video. It was later proven that it was not her. At the time that the video was taken, uh, this candidate was actually speaking at a different rally. However, the damage was already done because the text said that this is who you're voting for, this is her, and it mentioned her by name, uh, saying that this is how she treats her voters. Uh, so here again, we see that theme of the emotions of being irrational. And then it was, uh, unfortunately, was very popular also, very common to see the sexualization of uh, female politicians, whether it be uh, them showing an image, a little, uh, just a political campaign photo. And of course, out of everything that was highlighted by the account, they kind of circled her legs and said, well, this is why women should be in politics because they will show skin everywhere they go. This is what they do to get ahead, which this idea that women use their sexuality to get ahead was actually also visible uh, in the uh, campaigns, uh, especially given the fact that we did have a couple uh, that were running in the local elections. And then they were saying, well, for the man, they were criticizing him based on the age difference. Um, in the relationship and for the woman they were criticizing her uh, saying that she's actually using this sexuality to, as a way to gain favors in the political sphere so again a very large difference and this theme of sexualization continued uh, there was an image of one of an altered image of one of the politicians that was running uh, holding a sex toy and that was also proven to be manipulated by ai um, there was an ai generated image of a woman very, very negatively and very inappropriately dressed in a work setting. And it was saying that this is how women show up to work. It didn't name a specific candidate. It was just saying overall like that this woman showed up to work like that. And then of course, when you checked, it was actually an AI generated image. However, again, it was spreading this image that women are innately sexual and that they cannot do anything cannot do politics without having that sexuality be brought up. And again, that sexuality is continuously something that it's focused on. So in the polar cyberspace, and from what we've been hearing in a lot of other instances, uh, gender norms are very heavily utilized when it comes to hate speech and gender disinformation to actually discredit women. So when it comes to men, when they were critiqued, they were often critiqued based on their political uh, standing affiliations and women were being critiqued on characteristics. So not only does this actually further kind of install these gender norms because it's repeatedly saying that this is what women are doing, this is what they're failing at, so it's kind of strengthening them. It is also discouraging future women from participating in politics. I mean, in the case of the last, and I believe it was local elections, a woman was actually receiving uh, death threats to not only her but also her family so as we were also mentioning uh, how this can also lead to offline violence which I think is a connection at least in Poland that we don't discuss yet and something that I think as part of my recommendations should be something that is more talked about that this disinformation is not just uh, cyber bullying it's not just people saying random stuff online just to kind of let out their feelings, this can lead to actual offline violence and can make people feel unsafe. Gender disinformation makes women have to kind of fight for their way into power before they can even convince people that they are the right candidate for politics. They first have to even prove themselves of being worthy on the stage. So as my recommendations, uh, when it comes to Poland, this topic is not very well discussed yet. It is starting to gain more traction, uh, but this is something that definitely has to be included in initiatives when it comes to combating disinformation. Our Minister of Digital Affairs recently uh, spoke and published uh, a new plan on how to combat disinformation, how to make Poland cyber resilient, I think this topic definitely has to be something that should be highlighted. Uh, when I spoke about this uh, during some conferences in Poland to the Polish audiences, not many people knew the term gender disinformation. So I think that is something that we have to start with, uh, this education about uh, this problem, pointing out that it exists and continuing to talk about this problem to accept the fact that women are treated differently in cyberspace. Uh, when it comes to education, I also believe that uh, 
education about, for example, abortion is vital because a lot of the hate speech and a lot of the disinformation that was happening about abortion was just wrong in, when it comes to factually about the actual process of abortion. Um, so I believe just overall education about women's rights, about the reproductive uh, system, which I know that is a huge issue in a lot of uh, countries, how this education is approached. I think that definitely is something that we have to think about if we want to decrease this disinformation that we have about rights that affect women greatly. Um, and of course, debunking. So when we were analyzing the uh, presence of gender disinformation, in Polish cyberspace, we found that a lot of times most of these uh, trends were actually, and actors were actually active right before the election. So maybe when people are more active online to gain more information. Uh, so debunking and education has to come way before that. So people are prepared to see uh, these images and they're prepared to see these texts on their kid. They can mentally prepare uh, for any possible narratives and they can prepare for the fact that they may try to be misled by online actors. And that is all from me. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Eliza. And as we're almost at time, I'll give the floor straight to Buyan for our final presentation. Mm. Okay, can you hand me this? Good. So we are heading into the last 10, 12 minutes probably of our discussion. So I have a presentation which is more about the problems than about the solutions, but I believe it's important to understand uh, more in depth the problems in order to be able to think about solutions. So uh, it's about the anti-LGBT uh, rhetoric, and I would like to explain how and why is it so effective in encroaching on the civil space in so many countries. And I give some uh, examples from Russia, from Bulgaria, from Romania, from Hungary, and from uh, Slovakia. And it's mainly based on uh, parliamentary discussions and the documents that usually accompany legislation. Uh, and of course, obviously, I don't know all those languages. I use AI to understand text, to download the relevant information, and then I use uh, some code uh, to make uh, conceptual and uh, semantic networks and to analyze uh, what it's about. Uh, and I'll be talking, oops, okay. I have uh, a few main points. Uh, I want to show that hatred against LGBT people is very deeply rooted and it has a long uh, history in Central and Eastern Europe and also it has a long history in the ex uh, countries from the ex Soviet Union but I don't have uh, data about them but I can assure you that uh, data sets show uh, the same things. Uh, also I, I want to show that something that you probably all know that it has been declining for a very long time but now it goes up again and it uh, hasn't been uh, uniformly declining in uh, all the countries. Uh, then I'll show that internet now is the main media, and that's very important because it's a hy hybrid space, public-private. I mean, you're linked to politicians, also to your uh, neighbors or to your co-workers, uh, sometimes in one and the same place. And this hybrid space, this is a, something very important when it's about encroachment, and I will explain why. Uh, and then I want to show briefly that hatred is not necessarily logically co coherent and consistent. You cannot disprove it by logical arguments or explaining that it's, uh, things are not like that, that uh, something is different. It's much deeper than that. So that's why, finally, I'll show how it uh, is very used, easily used. So here there is a very long-term data set from the European Value Survey. Uh, it starts uh, early in the 80s, but uh, for most countries it's not available from early uh, in the 80s, but it's available from the late 80s. It's exactly when communist countries began to change. And then you can see, this is a very typical value question. Do you want homosexuals as neighbors? And here we have those that don't want homosexuals as neighbors. Obviously, they use this term, LGBT, 
uh, the, I mean, all this terminology evolved gradually, and also in sociology, you have to use terms that are understandable to the to the public. So uh, you can see here that it started from very very high levels in uh, ex-communist countries, uh, something like 70, 80 percent of people being ashamed. I took just the Netherlands at, as a as a reference country because uh, just, I could have taken Denmark or. Uh, or uh, Norway, uh, uh, as a reference country that for a very long time uh, was very tolerant uh, to LGBT people. I don't know where back in time it was like Bulgaria and Romania in the 80s, yeah, in Hungary, but probably sometime in the 60s there are no surveys from that period, or probably sometimes in the early 70s or something like that. Uh, okay, this is uh, this is, uh, unfortunately, it's only for the last year. Is homosexuality justifiable? It's also a value question. By the way, values are very important things, and I think this is one of the things that is missing in most of the analysis of online hate speech and of uh, anti-democratic and anti-liberal propaganda, is the, the values, because values are concepts that uh, are not influenced by something that is just happening in the world. You cannot change a value by news, for example. It's not uh, influenced by that. You can interpret any <laughs> news based on your uh, values in the way you wish uh, to do it. Uh, and I think this is, uh, this is Bulgaria. And you can see uh, this is uh, a question about with 10 uh, great scale. Is homosexuality justifiable? Of course, there is no news that uh, can convince you or any information or any event that can uh, uh, make you think that is justifiable or not justifiable. It's a value judgment. And you see the spectrum, it goes down, down, and then now it goes up again. Uh, and there are lots of uh, people in Bulgaria who say that it's absolutely unjustifiable in any situation, no matter what. And this is what they say in many other countries, for example, in Russia today, but also in Romania, even more than in Russia. It's a very religious and orthodox country. Uh, or are you ashamed having a, a close family member as gay? Of course, shame is a very deeply emotional, value-laden emotion, uh, so it's very difficult to change. If people feel ashamed from, by something, it means a lot, and you cannot easily change it. Uh, you have to work very hard on very foundational narratives and explanations, not just news or something like that. Uh, and finally, this is just from Bulgaria, but I want to show that the internet goes up. It's now uh, TV is behind uh, the internet now, so it means this becomes the most important media, and it's a hybrid space. I mean, TV, it's a public space. You invite people to, to talk to everyone. In the hybrid space, uh, there is no boundary between uh, public and private. And this is very important because it makes encroachment very easy from public to private, which is a very important step. Uh, so. Ah, this is from Bulgaria. Now it shows that uh, it doesn't need to be very consistent. Uh, there are lots of people, when you ask, they say, I, I don't approve hate speech. Hate is very bad. We have to fight hatred. Almost everybody in Bulgaria and many other countries say so. But when you present them with concrete examples of some very offensive uh, statements about different groups, they say this is okay. Uh, I mean, because why is it okay if you ask in a focus group? Because this is simply it's true. And I think uh, it's uh, just to say that those people are immoral or indulge in debauchery and so on and so forth. So you shouldn't be uh, just led away by looking at this very superficial sociological data that somebody states that uh, they are against hate or they are. Uh, they uh, for uh, rights and so on and so forth. Uh, in this slide, there are a few just explanations why it's so deep. Uh, because against uh, LGBT people, it's mainly a moral blame for other groups in Bulgaria, but also elsewhere. 
they are perceived as physical threat, as danger, and so on. LGBT people are morally blamed, uh, and this is uh, very difficult to fight, and it makes it very easy also to use for very various type of encroachment. And now I move to the final sections, just a few points from uh, Romania, Slovakia, Hungary, Russia, and Bulgaria, uh, and I, I will summarize. Uh, it's, uh, I'll explain how it works in the end. It's first about identity rights. Uh, th that's how they make the argumentation why we have to start uh, forbidding various things related to LGBT people. Uh, this is very strong in Romania, but also it appears uh, ev elsewhere as well. They say that uh, sex, for example, and even uh, sexual orientation is part of a person's uh, identity, so we have to protect it. Of course, you know we have to protect all traditional values, and I, here I took a lot of uh, statements concerning uh, marriage. Yeah, they, they, they are taken from the original document. And this is not from something on the Facebook. These are uh, legislators uh, presenting their arguments why we should adopt one law or another. Protection from ideological influence, including gender theory and so on and so forth. But it very easily moves from gender issues to other issues because at some point they say, but this uh, is supported also by other ideologies uh, or sets of ideas. So then you can start an attack on everything else that you want to, to stop. And it's about uh, education. But let me say how it works in practice. And this is not a description. And this is uh, next slide is uh, the last one. Uh, this is not a specific country. This is the whole conceptual framework which involves in time. And it moves from children to, it has three plus one dimensions, but moves from children to adults, from educational spaces to public, and then to, to private spaces. And then it moves from normal cisgender heterosexual people to also LGBT people to protect, but, uh, to protect them as well. And then finally, it moves from gender ideology to any ideology that is uh, compatible uh, with gender. So they, they start with children. Why? Because children, by definition, are not mature enough to be fully free to take their own decisions. So it's easy to explain why the government should do something to protect children, even if they don't, <laughs> don't want to be protected. Then it moves. Of course, first they say we do it at schools, but then say, they say, OK, the next step is, and Bulgaria is now at this step. Fortunately, they stopped for some reason. They say, but why only in uh, schools? Let's protect them in all public spaces. And then, uh, of course, when they say all public spaces, now here they could be also a child, uh, or I said something when a child heard it, and then the police can come and uh, start uh, some investigation and so on, but then they say, why only children? Uh, let's protect also the adults. There are some adults that are not mature, they are brainwashed, they are uh, subject to propaganda, so let's extend it, move it age by age. But then they say, well, why only public space? Let's also move in private space. At home, children learn things that are not uh, appropriate. And finally, you have to protect everybody everywhere, and gradually, uh, I'll show this, it also moves from protecting people to protecting things that are not people. For example, family is something that is not people, but it's made of still of people, but then they say we protect marriage, we protect social order, we protect responsible citizenship. And once you, you start protecting those kind of things, you don't anymore need a democratic consent because you protect those things from people. It doesn't uh, matter anymore if they approve it or disapprove it. So that's how it evolves and moves. Uh, and of course, this is just the conceptual part. Meanwhile, things are happening outside on the streets, which colleagues here described sometimes. And I think that's, that's it, more or less. OK? Thank you.
Uh, thank you, Boyan, especially for bringing the anti-LGBT angle in, in all of this. And especially your last slides about protecting things. I think we're definitely, Bulgaria has started with children. We'll see where, where we're gonna end up. And now I know we're already into the coffee break, but I would like to open the floor for a quick discussion. If there are any questions from the audience, we will take them now. <laughs> uh, there is a question over there. You can have the microphone. Thank you. Uh, my question is to Elisa, if uh, I have two questions to her, if she's still online. Let's find out if she's still online. Is Elisa still online? I am. Okay, hello. Um, I have uh, two questions to you. Why uh, <laughs> am I on the screen? Don't Sorry, I'm not able to see you. <laughs> Maybe, yeah, start yes, start Yes, hi. Uh, my first question is uh, about the disinformation campaigns, uh, which were with hate speech, uh, AI-modified photos, videos, and so on. Were you able to track any common source or sor sources of those campaigns? And if you did, were they connected to some known actors, to some governmental figures or parties, or, I don't know, some... Uh, outright organizations and my second question is ah, yes uh, my second question is uh, what is the uh, the what is the role of religion in this and church what is the connection of the church with uh, the government and uh, were there any well, I suppose there were um, church figures uh, talking about uh, these issues. Thank you. Okay, so thank you for those questions. Those are very good. Uh, when it comes to the first question, we didn't investigate uh, the sources, so we just focused on bringing up the trends and narratives because this is kind of a beginning step for this type of research in Poland. So I can't really say the sources as that was not analyzed, and I don't want to mislead you. Uh, however, we did find that a lot of the accounts which spread uh, gender-based hate speech and gender disinformation also spread uh, disinformation regarding migrants, regarding the war and COVID. So this kind of all went together. Uh, but that is as far as the extent that we had when it comes to finding the sources. That would have to be another uh, project which we hope to work on. And when it comes to the role of religion, that was actually a huge factor uh, when it comes to uh, this type of disinformation, especially in abortion. Uh, so Poland is a very religious country. Um, our former ruling party was, was much more aligned uh, with the Catholic Church. And you had a few, uh, and these weren't very known priests, but you did have a few accounts, or at least that were imitating to be priests, uh, that were saying that this is going uh, against God. Uh, so you when it come, this was mainly about abortion and about women uh, so saying that god created women for the purpose of having children so this was but most of this type of narrative was actually expressed maybe not by religious figures but by simple accounts that aligned uh with these uh views although it was also interesting to find i mean a lot of these accounts would have images of the cross or they would actually publish a lot of images of uh, Jesus and God and overall just Christianity. So that was very prevalent in many of the cases that were speaking specifically about abortion and motherhood. Um, thank you, any other? Yes, go ahead. Hello, um, I'm a sociology student. I want to thank all of you for these good presentations. Um, it's, I'm gonna give some comments and also like a direct question about uh, needing more research on the topic, do we need to focus only on like Eastern Europe? Because to answer, to comment on why did Bulgaria stop at we will protect public space, kids in public space? Um, I was like uh, I witnessed all the amount of activist effort that went into pushing against the anti-LGBT rhetoric with email campaigns and uh, diplomatic convoys going to EU parliaments, telling people. 
um, you, we, sh we should not let this pass. And this is how, like, you know, even a conservative party like Garib was convinced to be like, okay, we'll stop here because clearly Western Europe has its limits of what it accepts as conservative values. Because at the end of the day, these niches of like anti-gender and anti-LGBT propaganda aren't just a Russian issue because uh, the narrative of the decadent West exists in the West as well. And we will benefit to like expand our research everywhere. Uh, and that's why I was like asking, it has, I wanted to turn to Bugan to ask, is there research done on like different like networks? Can this method be used for uh, like on the, on the West side of like small narratives in, in the West? Because clearly it, uh, Western Europe is much better in this regard, even though such anti-gender movements exist in France, for instance, but they're not as successful. Thank you. <laughs> Go ahead, whichever one of you wants to take it. I'm just going to, I just want to mention uh, when you ask. Bulgaria is very important, for example, to be studied because it's uh, kind of the Trojan horse of uh, Russia in the European Union. So basically, as we saw um, in the presentation of Buyan, there is a recent spike uh, in the anti-LGBT orientation and attitudes among the public. So we can see how all of those things very quickly um, take hold here in the country. So it's kind of like a, a study ground. I mean, it's horrible to talk like this about our public, uh, but it is a very good uh, way to see how these, these things are developing. I think it's also the same case in Georgia, uh, because the issues of human rights were not that conflicting and preoccupying like 10 years ago uh, as they are now. Um, and when it comes to in comparison to the West, there is more research on this topic on the West for a long time. As for example, gender studies is something recognized overall in those countries, which is not the case here in Eastern Europe. Uh, and the case studies, but usually the case studies uh, in w the West, um, mostly focus on smear campaigns and direct attacks uh, on public figures. And as we can also see, there is rather more representation of uh, female politicians or even um, not so only female politicians, but people from different identities uh, in Western Europe because there are people who have been more assimilated. For example, as I can also give uh, Bulgaria once again as a horrible example, uh, we have a great community of Roma people in Bulgaria and there has been not a single person here at the conference. Uh, this would not be the case in other countries in the West. So that's why it is important to start doing this research here in Eastern Europe because it has not been started yet. I mean, it, it, these are literally the, uh, the baseline we're just covering right now. So that's one. Um, I also wanted to respond to this. Like, one thing is that, as I said, we're working in Sri countries on three different co continents. We're also now expanding to Philippines, so there will be more data coming, and you can check on our website, whatever. We just published also the country assessments. Um, but I also want to continue what uh, Christina started. Uh, it was also mentioned yesterday, like Kremlin disinformation is not only happening in Eastern Europe, with wars and conflicts going, especially war in Ukraine, you can find Kremlin money in Africa. You can find Kremlin money in Southeast Asia. You can find it, of course, in the US. That's why I think there is so much emphasis on researching Kremlin propaganda. And I think that's right. I also agree with you that you need to, but, but they are kind of uh, example of how to uh, perpetrate um, different spaces and how to shrink the spaces. So there is a logic behind, but I also absolutely agree that we need to also research like what this is, how this is affecting the similar developments in the other countries. And in Western Europe, it's also on the rise. We don't have in Western Europe countries where this decline is not shown right now. And we can see it in the elections, we can see it in um, coalitions that are breaking down in the Western Europe. So but looking at it from a global perspective, because it's not like when we are standing in streets in Georgia and then I'm thinking like, this is such like part of such a bigger picture. And if you don't look at this big picture, you can solve problems locally, but also if you are not like, 
mixing up this bottom-up approach, but also like looking at the bigger um, scale, I think is very important. And there is China, which is now playing a big role in um, creating propaganda. There is TikTok, and this needs to be researched because there is lots of data that's going on, and sometimes it's a uh, underaged um, people's data that is leaking very often. So yeah, there is a lot to do. Brian, are you gonna also contribute? Uh, I would say just a, a, a few words. Be, before passing away the creator of um, the World Value Survey, um, in his last papers, as I read them, was very disappointed that the, the world as a whole, because this survey is done in many countries in the, throughout the world for decades, it no longer appears to be moving towards a more secular and a more liberal world. So there are a kind of very sad papers. So it's not something very specific only for, for Eastern Europe. It, you can find this in uh, Western Europe. And by, by the way, Trojan is one of my students on the social network analysis course who came independently. And we can look next week uh, about France or Germany. <laughs> what's going on there. But it's, there will be things going on there as well, I'm sure. OK, thank you, everyone. Sorry about the delay. I think we'll stop it here, and we'll continue any discussions into the coffee break. Thank you. Thank you.